Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Nathaniel, and I'm an archivist at the Freedom Archives and the co-director of the, oh, the arch, I'm an archivist and the co-director at the Freedom Archives. And I'm nervous because all these wonderful people are joining me today. Um, the Freedom Archives is located in San Francisco, and our work centers on preserving, making accessible, and amplifying the voices of social movements and resistance. Uh, we do this work by maintaining an archive, as well as creating curricula, documentaries, audio projects, and more. And you can learn more about our work at freedomarchives.org. Today, I'm excited to moderate uh, Panthers After the Party, a conversation on Black Power Afterlives. This event is being brought to you by the Freedom Archives and Haymarket Books, who published the, the book that I referred to. Um, and this book was edited by Diane Fugino and Matef uh, Hermachis and features um, a numerous essays um, that examine the persisting impact of the Black Panther Party on subsequent liberation struggles by looking at former party members and the continuity of their work. Um, this book is available uh, through Haymarket Books and obviously we would encourage folks to, to check it out. It's, it's a really uh, valuable read. Um, four of the participants from that book uh, join us uh, today, um, and I'm really excited. Um, they are uh, Akinsanya Kambone, Sekou Odinga, Hank Jones, and Erica Huggins. And all of us over the next hour and a half are going to uh, talk a little bit about um, strategies and practices for sustaining their political work. And then we'll talk a little bit about continuity, commitment, and cultivating self-determination. I just wanna make a couple of kind of technical notes and then we'll jump into uh, the panel. Uh, the first is for folks um, with uh, accessibility needs, uh, there should be captioning available on all the platforms that you're engaging. And if there's any issue with that, uh, don't uh, please feel free to, to uh, engage the chat um, and, so, and thank you, uh, Haymarket, for providing that service. We appreciate it. Um, in terms of the structure of today's uh, panel, uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna hear individually from each person, for, and they'll kind of talk to us about uh, two questions which I'll ask that kind of center, um, you know, that will allow them to center some of their work and, and you know, uplift uh, their perspectives on, on the question. And then what we'll do is, uh, after everyone has had an opportunity to speak, uh, we'll kind of dive into a, a more dynamic conversation. We'll, uh, we'll ask some questions and bounce ideas off of each other, and folks can bring their different, uh, you know, robust and varied experiences to play in terms of the overall conversation. Uh, we'll do the best we can to get to anyone's uh, questions and answers, or we'll try our best to get to anyone's questions with answers. And if you want to put those in the chat box uh, and, you know, think about them while folks are talking. And if you want to put those in the chat box uh, when appropriate, you know, at the end, we'll try our best to address those. So uh, thanks very much. And what I'll do from here is I'm going to get ready to introduce our first speaker. Um, <clears throat> Akinsanya Kambone is a former lieutenant of culture for the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense, the Sacramento chapter. He created the Black Panther coloring book to bring attention to racial inequality and social injustice. After the Black Panther Party, Kambone dedicated himself to Pan-Africanism, teaching African spirituality, religions, history, and culture through multimedia art. In 1984, he founded the Pan-African uh, Art Museum uh, in Long Beach, California. Continuing the Panther ideology, he provides free programs for youth in art, leadership, and culture, and his ceramic sculptures are presently on exhibition at the Crocker Art Museum in Sacramento. Uh, so please help me in uh, welcoming uh, Akinsanya Kambone. And Akinsanya, thanks so much for being here. Uh, the, if, you, if you can go ahead and just speak to the two questions which I'll uh, go ahead and throw at you right now. Um, can you point to some strategies uh, in terms of sustaining your principles and political work? And although conditions have changed for you over the years, can you name one or two things 
that have helped you carry your political values through? You know, I think that conditions may have changed, but they pretty much stayed the same in terms of the problems that produced organizations like the Black Panther Party. When I first heard about the Black Panther Party, I was in Vietnam. I was in the Marine Corps. And I first heard about the Black Panther Party in a soul session that the brothers was having in our battalion. There was about 30 brothers. We'd get together once a week, and we would talk about the problems that we were having back here in the States. And every week, another brother would get a letter from home saying something about his brother, his cousin, his friend was killed by the police. So what kind of drove me to the Black Panther Party was point number seven. We want to meet it in to police brutality and the murder of black people. And uh, I have an illustration that I did on the 10 point platform and program that I illustrated for the Black Panther Party. And um, when you look at the way things are going, the same conditions exist. They produce Black Lives Matter. And it's the same fight. It's the same struggle. And I think that if we abide by the same principles, we can continue to fight because everything that existed then exists now, but tenfold. Um, I, don't, um, I don't really see that much has changed. I think that people, more people might be coming aware to some of the problems, but none of them have been resolved. When you look at all 10 points on that 10 point platform or program, nothing has really changed that much. So I'm still talking. <laughs> okay, I, well, and, and you know, I think that a lot of the things that happened to us, and I, I got to Vietnam in 1966. That was when the Black Panther Party was born in 1966. There's a place in Vietnam that nobody ever talks about. I haven't heard anything about it in the news. It was Long Bend Jail. It was a, it was a prison in Long Bend, Vietnam, and they called it LBJ. And it was built to house 400 inmates. They had over 900 African Americans in that prison. And the reason many of us was in the prison is because we had to confront the Aryan Brotherhood, the Ku Klux Klan, the American Nazi Party. We had confronted all of them in Vietnam. And the reason we know who they were is because they all carried the same flag, that Confederate flag. They had them over the, over the doorway of, the, of their hooches, wherever they stayed, they had a Confederate flag there. So whenever there was a firefight, we not only had to fight the Vietnamese, but we also had to watch our backs if any of these other or organized uh, racist organizations were behind us. And sometimes we got in physical fights with them. And whenever there was a physical fight, <laughs> the brothers would end up in Long Bend jail. And the racists would end up back out. They wouldn't go nowhere. So that was the problem. So we were primed and ready for this when we came back to, back to this country from Vietnam. We were primed and ready. And I was so fortunate that there was a Black Panther Party in Sacramento. When I saw that, my first notion was I didn't really want to be involved. I had enough of war. I've seen enough dying. I didn't want nothing to do with guns. That was my first impression. But then after a while, after the first thing happened with the police, and I caught, found myself pulling a little boy out from under the police car. They ran him down and had his foot stuck under the tire. And while I'm bending over pulling him down, these suckers come up behind me and hit me across my back and my head with this axe handle. They had nightsticks that were like axe handles. And when I got up from that, I took the little boy and, and I set him down and told him to go home. Then walking down the street, some other stuff happened. And I had a brother that uh, grabbed me because I was surrounded by about five or six police officers. <laughs> and they were getting ready to do me a job. His brother grabbed me and picked me up and carried me down the street away from him. And he told Poli, because I was, you know, sometimes you kind of go out of your mind. Uh, 
when you're in combat mode. That's they call that a flashback or post-traumatic stress disorder. That's what they call it now. But back then they didn't have a, a term for it. But I was ready to fight all those police officers with my bare hands. I was ready. And I probably would have been killed. But the brother carried me down the street and told him he was taking me home. And they did a whole lot of cussing, calling me the N-word. But um, the brother, when he put me down, he said he was going to join the Black Panther Party. And I thought about it. And I guess I had some artistic skills. And the Panthers asked me to do some drawings for them. And I did. And they were still trying to recruit me into the Pan Panther Party. But I wasn't trying to get in that. You know, it was I was I was a little bit petrified by the news media, the guns and all that stuff. I wasn't trying to get off into that again after Vietnam. But eventually, after I learned what the Panther Party was fighting for, I decided that I could be of assistance with the things that I learned in the Marine Corps. I knew about weapons. I knew about marksmanship, I knew about sight alignment and sight picture, and I knew about military drill. So I ended up um, in the Panther Party uh, teaching everything I learned in the Marine Corps. And uh, I just kind of, I just kind of gravitated towards it. Once I embraced the 10 point platform and program, I was really believing in what we were fighting for. And the same fight exists today, and I believe in that now. Um, in Vietnam, I got three Purple Hearts. I got blown up twice and got a punji stake through my leg. Well, the way I saw it, if I can do all that bleeding for America, how come I can't bleed for my own people? And so this is what I decided to dedicate my life to fighting for what we wanted in that 10-point platform program. So I committed my life to that until the Panther Party was infiltrated to such a good degree and people were throwing around the term provocateur agent and all this kind of stuff. I heard a lot of that. And when that Black Panther coloring book came about, they were trying to say that the FBI put it out and that I was the FBI agent. I heard all of that too. So, but you know, people that knew me knew that was a bunch of bull. And uh, I continued to work for the Panther Party. Matter of fact, I did the illustrations of the 10-point platform program after the coloring book. So people in the party who knew me, they knew I wasn't no agent. But, so I guess I'm supposed to stop. Thank you. OK. <laughs> that, thank you, though. That was very, very interesting. And the the centrality of the ways talking about the the lbj prison in vietnam that's i i had never heard of that and it's really interesting even in that context the centrality of prison as related to uh black people and the way in which the state uh uses that so thank you so much for sharing that and um I, i'm sure that there's so much more to talk about when we get into the discussion um the next person that i want to introduce is hank jones um, Hank is a formerly held United States political prisoner. He's been an activist since 1955 when he was compelled by the racist torture and murder of 14-year-old Emmett Till. Uh, Hank worked with uh, SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in San Francisco from 19, uh, in 1963, and then joined the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense in 1967. Uh, in 2003, he was one of the uh, former Panthers, who are now known as the San Francisco Eight, who were targeted by Homeland Security. Uh, and Hank continues to do social justice, political prisoner, and human rights work. Uh, Hank, uh, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Um, kind of like uh, I can sign you. I was uh, a Marine station in the uh, Japan in 1955. Or maybe I should back up a little. I was born in uh, Mississippi, northern Mississippi, in 1935, under strict uh, apartheid conditions. Now strictly segregated, you know, it was 
during the period when we got off the sidewalk for white people and didn't look them in the face and went around the back doors and separate entrances and things where we and uh, never went alone anywhere uh, as kids at night. I had a friend over and it got dark and you uh, and another per another kid would walk them part way home, you know, within sight of their homes. It was that kind of uh, situation because you could uh, disappear and, and be found in one of those rivers or lakes or something. Uh, but in 1955, I, uh, you know, got out of high school. No, I, I, uh, 54, I got out of high school and uh, worked the summer. I had a job and decided I didn't want to go to, uh, to college at that time. Plus, we didn't have the money. And uh, I joined the military because of the GI benefits. And uh, was headed for combat in, uh, in uh, Formosa back then, uh, Taiwan now. Uh, supposed to go there and fight the Red Chinese. But uh, the war ended before I got there, and uh, they changed orders in the middle of the ocean, and I ended up in Japan. And uh, in 1955, we got the uh, Jet magazine with the uh, photos of uh, Emmett Till. And uh, his body, that is, and, uh, that had been fished out of a uh, river there. They had uh, brutally tortured Emmett, 14 year old black kids, visiting his uncle from Chicago, Illinois, accused of uh, insulting a white woman, whistling at a white woman. And uh, and by the way, uh, just recently she admitted uh, that that was uh, a lie, that he hadn't done that. But uh, they took him in out of his uncle's home in the middle of the night, tortured him for hours, beat him, shot him, shot his uh, split his head open with the ax, tied his body to a 50 pound uh, industrial fan and uh, threw him in, the, in that uh, river. When the body surfaced, uh, his m my mother went there and identified it and, and uh, she was wise enough to uh, have a open casket ceremony funeral for him. and the world got to see what those savages had done to him uh, it was grotesque like his face his head looked like a big clump of meat with one eyeball hanging out of it. and uh when I saw those pictures in the Jet magazine, uh, I lost it. And uh, I was mad. I went, went on, you know, just my life changed that day. I was going, I was one way before I met and the complete opposite after. I made up my mind that day that I was not going to put up with any more insults from these races. 
and that uh, they were going to have to kill me too. So uh, we started waging the campaign over there. Like uh, Mark and Sonia was saying, they had the town strictly segregated. The, the little town outside the base strictly segregated. We were a small uh, marine comp company right next to this gigantic army base. And they had uh, us segregated in that town. They had two locations we were allowed to go to before Emmett. And uh, these were our little juke joints that we had there. And we, uh, you know, played our music, danced our dances, and drank our booze. And... But after Emmett, we decided we're going to integrate to everything. Even the uh, the uh, we call it a slop sheet. It's a bar on the base was segregated, and we started out uh, integrating everything, which meant we had to fight every time we went to town, and that's what we did. And we did that for about a solid year. And when we were done, or before we were done, we even uh, established curfews for white. They couldn't come to town without getting whooped. And uh, they obeyed those curfews. Once they got tired of us whipping up on them. But, uh, and there were only 13 of us blacks in the company. But uh, it gave me a valuable, taught me a valuable lesson. A small of people, number of people, if they stand together, they have each other's back, they can accomplish things, they can make a difference. That was a lesson that uh, I took away from experience in Japan. After we were done, we could go wherever we wanted to and no Oh, so we went back to our juke joints and we <laughs> drank our hooch and started with each other. We just didn't want to be denied the access because of students. And we made our point. And I came uh, home and uh, suffering from hope. from work and watch people speak. Uh, 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 Hey, Hank, we're, yeah. we're having a hard time hearing you. Um, so we're going to try to fix the, the audio. Um, sorry about that. Thank, no. thank you. So, oh, well, yeah, you kind of faded out in there, I think, but thank you so much for sharing that and, to, and, and leaving us with the lesson of people standing together and having each other's backs. And uh, we'll, see what, we'll see if we can get everything squared away so that the discussion will go smoothly. Okay. Okay. The next person I want to introduce is uh, Erica is an educating, uh, leading Black Party and Black Political Party member, former political prisoner. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Right. Hit me. For 45 years, Erica has lectured in the United States and internationally on restorative practices and the role of spiritual practice in creating social change. Thanks so much for being with us today, Erica. Thank you. Can you hear me okay, everybody? Yes. And I just want to say hello to everybody who is participating that we cannot see. And I also want to honor all of the Black Panther Party members who have gone on. Um, so many of our friends um, were in it for the long haul and um, transitioned from this life. And that brings me to a point I want to make, Nathaniel, unless you wanted to ask me a direct question. I was thinking about Black power after lives and how in my life it feels as if I have lived a number of lives and I was 15 when I was impressed by as a as a little black girl in Washington DC going to the March on Washington for jobs and freedom by myself against my parents wishes I didn't know what all that meant and, but I was very touched to see all those hundreds of people who had arrived there from all over the country, black people. And I was also impressed by the speakers that day, although I don't remember their, their speeches. But during that time, I made a vow to serve people for the rest of my life. And I had no idea what was in the fold of that tapestry at all. And um, I went to a historically black university, Lincoln University, outside of Philadelphia. And right near the campus, the Klan was, was burning crosses. It doesn't matter where you go in the United States, it's, it's the same. And it's due to structural, institutional racism. The only way that Long Ben Jail could have been created, the only way that Emmett Till could have been so brutally murdered, um, leaving his mother to suffer and his whole family to suffer, um, is because it had been okayed since the ships arrived on these shores. And there's a history that we don't need to go into, those of us on the screen, but there may be people who are listening who need to think through what happens when history goes uninterrupted in its harm. So I became an educator a long, long time ago. I always loved working with young people, and I still do. And that's the through line in my life. No matter what has been different, there have always been young people. And I feel very honored. If you're out there, young folks, I believe in you. We believe in you. We know that we're not going to live forever. But legacy is an important thing. And our stories are powerful. And our non-judging mentorship is even more powerful than that that we give to the people who are wondering, what do we do now? So I wanna say something about the Black Panther Party's community survival programs, which when Hank was talking, um, I was thinking about it. When our wonderful artist was talking about it, I was thinking about it, that the 10 point program of the Black Panther Party, every point was attached to a community survival program because we thought the revolution was gonna happen in our lifetimes, right? Not understanding that it's a continual process. It begins and it just doesn't end. That isn't a, a negative, it's the truth. It continues 
I do believe that seeing young black women and men and children standing up for good, and I want to say I was especially touched by them in this last year, but all through my life I've been touched by young people who stood up for good because we were young. Median age of Black Panther Party members, 19 years old. I was 18 when I joined. And so I want to mention that these community survival programs, no one has forgotten them. They've been replicated all over the world. That was in Brazil, where a man, a young 19-year-old man, started a free food program based on reading about it in an old party newspaper. Never met anybody connected with the party. It didn't matter. In New Ze- in Auckland, New Zealand, the Pacific Rim people started the Polynesian chapter of the party. Sight unseen, any party members. They just thought we were doing good for humanity. And yet in this country, the Federal Bureau of Investigation's counterintelligence program was picking us off arresting, jailing, and killing us, and, and, and telling everyone that we were thugs, hoodlums, terrorists, and murderers. And we really weren't. We were just these big-hearted young people. And so these programs, people come when they, before COVID, when I could walk around in the city of Oakland, It would never fail that somebody would come up to me and say, you know, aren't you, Erica? The breakfast program fed me. My mother sent me every morning to have breakfast. I would have been a hungry kid. When I was teaching, a student told me that he had sickle cell anemia, the disease, not the trait, that his parents had both had won the trait and won the illness, but without sickness. And when he became ill because of the party's intervention on sickle cell anemia, its testing and screening and embarrassing the American Medical Association as a result, this young man's mother was able to advocate for him when he was sick. He was 19 years old when I met him and he said, I'm forever grateful to the Black Panther Party for this. We wouldn't know these stories unless we asked for them. And so I just love that Diane and Matif put this book together so that we could hear some stories. And I'm looking for the stories of young people who can attest to the legacy of the party. I mean, I hear it, but I just was thinking while I was listening to everything that you, that all of us are saying, how beautiful it would be to have young people talk in an anthology about the legacy of the Black Mm. Panther Party. I ran the Black Panther Party's Oakland Community School, which was the pivotal and most precious part of my life because we decided, point five, we wanted decent education. We want to know our place in society. We want to know who we truly are. And point five um, was the jumping off point for the Oakland Community School, which served 150 children. That was our capacity. We were a replicable model. We had three meals a day. We taught the children to meditate after lunch. We had martial arts. We had a curriculum where teachers were mandated to go anywhere in conversation that the children needed to go. They wanted to talk about slavery. We talked about slavery. They wanted to understand racism and how it still exists. We talked about it. That school was open from 1973 to 1982. And those now 50-something-year-olds are telling me stories I would never have known about transforming their lives. So I think that the, the, the through line of working with young people and the party survival programs, they can be replicated today. I think that anyone in earshot of this event 
can think about what they can do in their communities, like what we did when we were younger. Um, and it doesn't have to be huge. You don't have to be a political prisoner like Hank. You don't have to survive war and strife. You can do your part. I think we, if there's a misconception that an activist has to be out in front doing something huge. We are all capable of doing whatever is necessary in the skin that we're in with the skills, ta talents, and experiences that we do have and with the love in our hearts. All of a sudden, I remember Fred Hampton, just that minute. And his love for the people that he talked about all of the time. And there's a film coming out. Please see it, everybody, Judas and the Black Messiah, which threads the heinous work of the counterintelligence program and the grooming of black informants. But also, it, it, it tells you, if you're willing to listen to it and see it and know it, the profound love that drew us all together. We didn't hate anybody. We loved our communities. And we didn't want to see any more Emmett Tills. Of course, there have been hundreds, some whose names we can say and some whose names we'll never know. So I, I think I'm seven minutes now. And um, I want to say that the most important thing that I want to leave everyone with, which is um, something I learned when I was incarcerated, is that it is important, as someone once said to me, if you in it, if you in it for the sprint, you show up before an event, you don't have to take care of yourself. You can just go home and rest. But if you in it for the long haul, you have to take care of yourself. And that's something that I learned of all places in solitary confinement, that I had to take care of my mind, my heart. <laughs> my old stories had to go my doubt, and in its place, confidence and courage and um, compassion and empathy for myself, first of all, but then for everybody else. And now that's one of the things when I travel and speak that particularly young women of color want to hear more about. How do we take care of ourselves as we do the work the cultural and social work, as we restore justice, as we abolish prisons, as we stop police brutality today in the 21st century, um, how, what do we do? How do we take care of ourselves? And it is crucial. So thank you for having me here and thank you Nathaniel for facilitating all of this. And I wanna thank Diane and Matifa again, and and all of the all of my friends seated in this um, park in the woods. <laughs> all right. Uh, really, uh, really wonderful. Um, and I know just through my work at the Freedom Archives, how many young people are continuously touched with all of these stories. Um, one of my favorite things about being there is just the energy from seeing people, uh, make, you know, change their lives through, you know, similar processes that, that all you speak of. So, um, so I can definitely attest to that. Um, our next speaker is going to be Seku Odinga. Um, and Seku is a founding member of the New York Black Panther Party and the international section of the Black Panther Party. He was a soldier in the Black Liberation Army and a political prisoner uh, for 33 years. Uh, since exiting prison in 2014, he's been a public speaker, a writer, a political activist, and the founder of the Northeast Political Prisoner Coalition. Welcome, Seiku. Hello, people. It's an honor to be here among my comrades. 
I'm glad you be still and uh, as uh, Nathan, you said, I'm, I'm a founding member of the New York Black Panther Party. I was the first uh, Bronx section leader of the Black Panther Party. And years ago, I was uh, a part of the organization of Afro-American unity that Malcolm X started. So uh, struggle has been a part of my life as long as I can remember as I've been involved on all my adult life, definitely in uh, some sort of struggle against oppression, against uh, what I considered uh, wrong, wrongs being perpetrated against people of African descent, especially, and uh, oppressed people in general. Uh, I heard each of the uh, speakers before me speak about some of the the jails and, and prisons and uh, people going to the, that's my work. My work has been to, since I'm coming home after spending 33 years as a political prisoner myself for uh, among other things, the liberation of Asada Shakur and uh, expropriations of uh, armored truck. Uh, work has been to uh, stand up or to highlight for the release of other political prisoners. It's in but this, I think that's mainly what I'd like to speak about at this point is that uh, there are political prisoners here in the United States. It's claims that there are not. The government here says there are not. But there are many political prisoners, many. We from the Black Panther Party still have, I think it's 14 political prisoners uh, still in prison. Some of them, like uh, Chip Fitzgerald, has been in for over 50 years. You yeah. know? Uh, many of uh, many, most of them have been in for at least 30 years, 20 to 30 years. I think the least is uh, Imam Jamil Alameen, and he's been in uh, around 20 some years. Uh, then you have uh, people like Sudiata Coley, who's been down for. <laughs> Uh, 40 some years, about 48 years. Uh, and it's important that people not forget those who fought for them. And this is this is the message I think I like to bring to this here forum at this point is that we must we must remember our political prisoners. No political prisoner. Uh, the list of demands that we release our political prisoners. And so that that's that's a story that I think we need to hear, or that's a, a message I think we need to hear. And why are political prisoners political prisoners? What made them uh, political prisoners? And I would I would say the love of their people. We need to understand that. Our political prisoners are in, in prison because they were struggling for our people. Before, of course, they loved our people and was willing to sacrifice their lives, their time, their families. Because when when you're in prison, you don't you're not there by yourself. Your family suffer right along with you. Your loved ones suffer right along with you. And those who are in prison for struggling against the, the oppressions of our people. Uh, their families also struggle. We need to find out who they are. We can always go to uh, some of the, the political prisoner sites like uh, Jericho.com uh, uh, the North East Prisoner Coalition. There's a number of political prisoner organizations and committees that work for the release of political prisoners that go to and find out 
who our political prisoners are, where they are, and uh, we really have to do that. We really need to do that. Our political prisoners are there. Of course, uh, police can, of course, a, a police a, a brutalization of our people because they felt the need to make sure that there was a consequence for the murder of black people. There was a consequence for the brutality of black people. And they stood up and took it upon themselves to, to, to create that consequence, to fight back in whatever ways they could. And so that, that turned out many times to be what caused them. Not only some of them wind up in prison, but many died. Many of our comrades died struggling for our people on different levels. You know, some they picked up arms, which international law gives us the right as oppressed people to do. People have to understand that it's not wrong for people to fight back. That's that's a human right that we have, and it's actually a legal right because the international law, which this country has signed themselves, gives us the right to, to fight back by any, all means to, uh, uh, to free ourselves, no matter what that... that uh, means might take. If it takes arms, if it takes strikes, it takes uh, uh, demonstrations, whatever it takes to free ourselves, we have a right to do it. No one has the right to tell us how we can struggle to free our, ourselves, to free our people. And our, our comrades that are locked up in these prisons and these gulags, around this country. Most of them are in very bad conditions. Most of them are elderly nowadays. Many of them, most of them have uh, uh, medical problems. We've lost a number of our political prisoners to medical neglect in, in these prisons. Uh, uh, people like Noah Washington, people like uh, Kowasi Balagoon, Abdullah Majid, uh, uh, Bashir, uh, Hamid, these brothers died in prison from uh, from uh, medical neglect because they uh, couldn't get the medical attention and, and, and that they deserved and needed. And we have political prisoners today that need uh, need that help. People like Mumia Abdul Jamal, uh, Jamal uh, people like. Uh, Matulu Shakur, people like uh, Kamal Sadiqi, uh, people like Ibn Jamil, uh, and many of the rest uh, have medical problems that are, are life-threatening problems that, that they really need to uh, 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 advocate for them, to, to speak out for them, and to demand that they get, not only that they get the medical that they need, but that they get be released so that their families and their loved ones can help them uh, heal and, and be old and strong again. So this, this is what I really like to bring to us today. And I, I hope we, I hope I haven't left it all too thick for you, but it, it can't be too thick, really. We really do need to be picking up uh, advocating for our political prisoners, our prisoners of war, uh, and uh, demanding that they be the attention that they need medically and that they be released back into the communities to their people. Uh, these uh, prisoners I'm talking about are grandfathers, some are great grandfathers, some of them have never ha held their grandchildren never been able to keep their grandchild, you know. We need to make the make sure that this this uh terrible condition, this terrible thing that's going on today where they reach out to their family and that they are able to get back with their family, with their community, with their loved ones. Uh, I'll stop here, I guess, uh, and say that hopefully what I've said, people will take to heart.
and we'll find out who the political prisoners and support the release of our political prisoners. Free them all. Thank you, Seku. Uh, really appreciate that. And um, the same way that there's been successes in getting some folks out over the past couple years, and that's been really exciting. As you mentioned, there are still lots of people who are locked behind bars that need our support. Uh, just for the sake of sharing the resources, um, I'm just going to reiterate some of the things that Seku just said. You can check out Jericho, the Jericho Movement's website, Northeast Prison Coalition, and then also on the Freedom Archives website, we have a, um, uh, a listserv where we send out emails about political prisoner news. Uh, so any of those resources would be good to, uh, to, to, to keep up on that and, and to support. And I know there's others as well. Those are just three that come to mind. Um, so now is both the exciting, but also a little daunting and challenging part where I'm supposed to throw all of you into a conversation and we're gonna do all this over this technology. Um, so we're gonna do what we can, uh, but um, you know, I'm just gonna throw some questions out there for folks. And um, if, if you feel like you've got something that you wanna you know, speak to, obviously, you know, just you can speak up and, and I'll try my best to kind of moderate and you know everyone doesn't have to answer every question so if you feel like you don't have anything to say about it i've got lots of questions so you don't have to force yourself um but we'll try that for a while and, and see what happens and I, i'm excited about this piece um so one, one of the things that um there are lots of things that were raised that i want to talk about and or ask about but i was also took an opportunity to review some of the book before this conversation. And a couple things that really came to mind through looking at your stories and the chapters, um, I was wondering if uh, you could say more about the ways that imagination and creativity have uh, influenced your political action and, um, you know, over the years. I'm sorry, I didn't. <clears throat> Does anyone want to take that question on, or I can throw a different one out there? Oh, yeah, I, was, I, had, a, I had a couple of questions. Um, one of them was for uh, Sekou. Did you know David Brothers? It's somewhere else. It's supposed to be Andrew's question. What was the question? <laughs> oh, yeah, I can answer that. But uh, well, the creativity is a lot of the a lot of the history of things that happen. I found that when you can put it in in art terms or in the form of artwork. You can talk about a lot of things and people can see these things that happened to us historically that we may not have experienced. But when you hear about it, you can draw about it, you can write about it, you can paint about it, and you can express that. And I found that um, a lot of the stuff that was done uh, was history. If you look at the Black Panther coloring book, it was actually a history book. It wasn't supposed to be a coloring book, but that's what it evolved into. But it was basically a book for people who could not read. And one of the reasons that I wanted to do that book was because I was illiterate when I got drafted in the Marine Corps. I didn't join. I was drafted. Had I tried to join, I would have never made it because I was illiterate. But while I was in the Marine Corps, I was around a lot of brothers who were older than me that put me down with some history. And the history that they put me down was history that I could be proud of as a young man. Nat Turner, Denmark V.C., Gabriel Prosser, all the slave revolts we talked about in those soul sessions. So when I designed that coloring book, one of the first things I wanted people to know, because it's something that I didn't know, I didn't know anything about any slave revolts growing up as a child, as a boy. I didn't know that we had so much resistance from oppression that we had. And people who are oppressed resisted. That's what Nat Turner did, that's what Denmark Vesey did. So I was gonna 
illustrate that for other people who didn't know, who may be adults and like me were illiterate. So I put it simply so you could look at it and get that history that they'll never teach you in these schools. That's um, one of the things. Um, and there's a lot of other things that come out with poetry, writing and songs. And I've, I've seen a lot of poets in the Black Panther Party and I've heard a lot of poems, a lot of songs, a lot of singing. Uh, the sisters of the Panther Party especially Sacramento chapter. We had some sisters that did a lot of singing. Matter of fact, they got a famous uh, portrait of these sisters standing up with the fist clenched and the afros. Those are Sacramento Panthers. <laughs> I know all of them because I trained them, you know, and that was beautiful to see that. Cool. Thank you for that. Did, did anyone else want to take on that question? I'd just like to uh, point out that uh some Bible programs in the uh, needs of our people. There's creativity involved in that. Teenagers actually, you know, they remember it was like most of the needs of the community. They developed all these uh, programs. They're Genius. And they, and they's uh, struggle, today's movement. Today's activists are going change today. <laughs> I'm sorry. Hey, hey Hank, we're having some trouble with your audio. Um, Hey Erica, while we work to try to get uh, Hank's audio fixed, do you want to do you want to jump in and say something about creativity and imagination? Um, I do. I I was remembering um, how with the Black Panther Party's community survival programs, um, we had to imagine those programs. We didn't have any money. Party members weren't paid. A lot of us were just living hand to mouth and. I ran the Oakland Community School at first. I was collecting a welfare check. So we had to imagine the programs in existence. We couldn't sit and say, oh, we want to do this, but there's no money. There, there was money. There were people. With the People's Free Medical Clinics, there were doctors who and, and specialists and nurses and, and med students who worked for free. And those clinics that stretch all across the country, named after some of many of our ancestors, but also party members who uh, left too young and too soon. And um, I was thinking about the imaginative and creative way that we created Oakland Community School. We sat down one day and we, in a staff meeting, we said, well, what is it that when we were children in our various locations around the country, the South, the East, the North, the Northwest, and the West, what were the things that we would have wanted in a school? Because we went to public schools. 
And we wanted to be seen and heard. We wanted to be loved exactly as we are. We wanted our brilliance to be noted. And we wanted playfulness and a sense of uh, family at a school, a sense of community at school. None of those things existed because it was a very white and very male paradigm that the public schools um, arrowed forward from. So we had to create it while we were doing it. We didn't have any role models for anything we did. As a matter of fact, women in the Black Panther Party had role models from the very past, but not in our generation. So we had to be the women that we wanted to see. And that's how the Black Panther Party was. If the people said to us, and I'm saying the people, not in a... Um, not in a rhetorical kind of way. That is how we talked about our communities. If someone said, y'all need to have a free shoe program, then we thought about, well, what was being said? And then we asked some questions. Well, like, what would the shoe program, who would it be for? Well, first of all, it'd be for the babies because in the cold months, we can't send them to school with no shoes. So we thought about it. We listened we did it. And that was how 64, 65 community su survival programs were created over time and around the world and still being replicated. Many of us, Tarika Lewis tells a, a really hilarious story about being the first woman to join the Black Panther Party at age 16. And she was laughed at by the men in the party office in Oakland, except Bobby Seale stopped them from laughing and said, if the sister wanted to join the Black Panther Party, well, she should. And she said it was that day because she's a violinist. She still is. She's a violin teacher. She's an incredible musician and artist and poet. She said it was that day that I put down the violin and I picked up the gun. And it's funny but it's poignant because then she was able to pick up the violin again and bring her art to all these wonderful young people in the Bay Area and beyond. So it wasn't that we thought, well, actually, I don't think we thought we were gonna live to see tomorrow. I know I didn't. I just knew the day was ahead of me and I had to be creative in that day if I had to go to a funeral, maybe I had to borrow somebody else's black dress. Or if I had to go speak somewhere, some, some comrade in the party would loan me something decent to wear. We were just really clever and we were good hearted. And I think we didn't know how to take care of each other in the ways that were needed, but we kind of figured it out as we went along. So I think that fierce imagination is necessary. That holding on to all old ideas about what activism looks like and what getting people free of prison looks like. It, they, there may be some good things we can carry forward, but the new is always welcome. And um, so thank you for asking that question. It's always on my mind, you know, um, the creativity. And we learned it from movements around the world. People were so creative. Yeah, I can tell you, please. So um, talking about creativity and spirituality, I know that one of the things that uh, inspired me it was in the 90s and some kind of way a thing came to me about Rwanda and this was before it was in the news mm -hmm. and I started working on a piece that was about Rwanda and the, the next day next week they started showing all these bodies piled up on the side of the road of the killings and um, I think that I had a class of young children and one little girl asked me when we were talking about Rwanda, 
and we were working on some pieces about it in the class, she said, Professor Cambone, why don't you do something about it? Why don't you do something? And I thought about it, and I thought about it almost all night. The next morning, I told my wife, I said, you know what? Give me a ticket to Rwanda. I got to go. So she got me a ticket, and I went to Rwanda. And I was able to visit Rwanda during that genocide. I was able to take pictures in churches of bodies piled up on bodies, bodies piled up five feet high. And I, I, I got some kind of a, a spiritual connection where I can do things with my hands and I don't even know what it is. But then I'll find out about it later. And when I came back from Rwanda, I found out that all the lies that they tell us about the tribes, tribes fighting each other, the Hutus and the Tutsis, these are not different tribal distinctions. These are what they call class distinctions. They're class distinctions. The Tutsi were the ruling class and the Hutu were the peasants. And they were armed by the French in 1959. They, the peasants were armed by the French because the, the, the Tutsi had demanded independence. And that goes right along with all of our liberation movements in Africa. You know, 1957 was, was uh, Ghana, 58 was Guinea, and in 59, that's when uh, the song Watusi came out. I know some of us remember it, but that was because of how courageous those Watusi warriors were going up against machine guns with spears. Now, they lost, but we were still proud of them. They were courageous in their fight. And I finished that piece when I got back from Rwanda, and it was very relevant and was right on the money. Uh, and I related that like tribal war. I related it like the so-called Hutu and so-called Tutsi class distinctions, but I related to the blood and crip, the way that we are divided and they get our warriors to fight in each other. That's one of the things that this system does very cleverly. They do that. They do it all the time. Um, I was liberated from death row when I was in the Sacramento County Jail fighting a murder case. Police officer got killed, and I was arrested for it. And I, I, I never heard of a black man being charged with killing a white police officer. I never heard of them being acquitted. That's one of the reasons when this acquittal came, I was shocked. Matter of fact, my daddy even came to visit me when I was on death row, and I hadn't, I hadn't seen him since I was 15. And um, when I visited him after I got out, I asked my daddy, I said, well, you know, you came to visit me, and I, you know, I, I hadn't seen you. And I was wondering what was going on. He said that he, he explained to me and go back that he what is that? He explained to me that he thought that was going to be the last time he would be able to see me. Because when he told me why he left Sacramento, I was like blown away. I said, well, don't you know the statute of limitations never runs out? on murder? And he said, yeah, he said, I knew that, but I came back to see you anyway. Because he, he left Sacramento because of another police officer that died in a fight. They used to, police used to come in and rob him at the nightclubs. And they were robbing him this night. He had won $500, stuck it down in his sock. When they had him against the wall and they started patting him down, he grabbed a pool stick and, you know, went upside one of his head. He got away and had to leave. But, you know, this is just spiritual stuff. And I think it's, it's some people are really into that whole spiritual thing, and I am too now, you know? But I think that's a good point. Go ahead, sorry. I get carried away sometimes. No, literally that's why we have you on this panel, to get your perspective. So it's all good, that's what we want you to do. Um, I want to ask another question, um, and, and this, uh, so Erica mentioned it just during, uh, her, her remarks around, um, 
uh, an effect that her imprisonment had on her political practice in terms of taking care of herself. And she mentioned um, when she was in solitary confinement that this happened. And I was wondering uh, if, if other people who were incar or previously incarcerated uh, don't mind sharing if there were any uh, political lessons or not lessons, but um, how did your political practice change because of your incarceration or your ideas about movement building? Um, and if anyone wants to take that on. I don't know, Seiku, can you hear us? Yes, I heard that. You're going in and out. Do, do you want to remark upon how, uh, if any of your political practice changed while you were incarcerated? Uh, all right. I, yes, I guess I could. I can remark on it. Uh, it, it didn't really change that as much. I mean, I don't, obviously the things that we did inside we couldn't do on the outside, but we continued to organize people. We we continued to organize against the pro, the problems that were in the joints, uh, in the in the different prisons. We uh we were we took you know. We uh, uh, advocated for uh, some of the the uh, prisoners that were being uh, unfairly treat treated. We advocated for those who needed uh, uh, medical attention and couldn't get it. Uh, so uh, a lot of what we did on the, on the outside, we we continue to do on the inside, and we also continue to work with formations on the outside while inside. And uh, people would call, would ask us for our advice, would ask us for what did we think uh, uh, they should do with, in this situation or that situation. So I think we, at least I did, and, and the brothers that I was around stayed active while in prison and, and uh, continued to do the same type of work uh, that they were doing on the uh, outside of course uh we we wasn't we didn't have no breakfast program but we did have set up uh, uh educational uh, programs we did set up book clubs and things like that so yeah uh i think that uh the the those of us that were active continued to be active all while we were in prison and, and created other things like i know a number of the brothers started writing Poetry, write, writing plays. I, I I participated in a couple of plays by different uh, uh, revolutionary brothers like Jamal Joseph. He he wrote a couple of plays. Uh, 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 Jihad Mumit, the the head of the uh, Jericho uh, movement, he wrote a couple of plays that I was uh, I was involved in. So uh, we did things. We kept we kept on creating. We kept on uh, 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 working to uplift our people, to uplift the conditions in, in, that we found ourselves in. And so, uh, so that's what I, I would say. Thank you. And Hank, I know you have something you want to say about this as well. I can hear you, there's just an echo.
Great. No problem. Thanks for staying with us. Um, if you want to just say anything about ways in which prison uh, influenced your political practice. karate and all that so I uh, decided I was going to join the army then and I did that and it gave me uh, religious freedom so I had access and I could move about I could get in their own population and uh, that's how I uh, ended up the nation of Islam even though I had seen Malcolm in 1961 in Oakland, and I knew one day I was going to be a Muslim. <laughs> so uh, it worked out that way. But uh, while I was inside, I, uh, I went inside myself. I had time to do that. And uh, of course, in the nation of Islam, we fasted. Uh, every month and uh, you know for three days and uh, sometimes I go longer than that I fasted as much as 10 we can hear you Hey, okay, it, it looks like, like, it looks like we're still getting uh, some tech stuff squared away. Um, um, but, but I also see, see that. that. Hey, hey, hang juice there. there. Um, it, it looks, looks like, like we're also coming towards, towards uh, 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 you know, we're getting, getting towards the end of our panel. panel. And what, what I want to sure that everyone. Hey, Hank, uh, you hung up. Are you yeah. there, Hank? Yeah, I'm uh, getting trapped in tricked up in this in this uh, technology you know but uh, you know okay. I, I was just saying that I uh, began to meditate and uh, fast and uh, and uh, do some introspection a lot of introspection and um, you know I had a, a background in psychology so it wasn't uh, you know I never had used it on myself, so I I did that while I was locked down and uh, did a lot of running and uh, and uh, you know it opened up um, uh, my, you know me spiritually and uh, I think that uh, being confined in one way or another was uh, probably the best thing for me at that time. Not that I'd recommend it, but uh, when you're in there, you can either fall into that prison life or you can uh, find other outlets, you know. And uh, I chose to go inward. 
and also to go to school, you know. And, uh, you know, and then be involved with Islam, you know. So uh, I was one of the first, uh, when we went to Orthodox Islam, we had a close circuit connection with Chicago with the war of the Muhammad's. And uh, we did the, uh, at McNeil Island, we had one of the first uh, Juma uh, prayer services in in federal prison. I was the first Muezzin, so I, I called people to prayer. So, uh, but when I got out uh, of prison, I uh, was supposed to go to Chicago and continue on with uh, my Islamic training. But uh, I found my family was in dire straits, you know, and they hadn't told me about all this. So I had to take uh, the first job I could find in the uh, and I took a job as a machinist in a uh, small shop in Berkeley and uh, canceled a lot of uh, plans I'd made, you know. But uh, that's what I uh, did with my time on the inside, you know, going to school, studying uh, Islam, uh, fasting, exercising, you know. Thank you for sharing that. Um, as, as we kind of near the conclusion of our event today, I'm just wondering if, um, you know, maybe we can just go around and if folks, um, I don't want to say if, I don't want to put them on the spot and say if they have any advice, but based on some of the things that we've been talking today, you know, education, creativity, imagination, uh, you know, uh, spirituality, uh, how do, how do folks see this moment? And, you know, if they could share anything with people moving forward, you know, in terms of something that they're thinking about or, or feeling about this moment, if they'd like to share that as perhaps kind of a way to propel the continuity of your work uh, into younger, you know, people on this call so that the work that you've done can continue through all of us. Do you want to start, Akinsanya? Yeah, I would. I would say um, that this day in this age, I would look to Africa. I think that uh, our people should turn their attention to the Pan African struggle. This African liberation movement is moving full speed ahead, and our brothers and sisters at home need us, and we need them. I. Uh, I looked at this whole situation with African people all over the world, and I saw when I went to um, Uganda, I was telling people about Mumia, Mumia Abu Jamal. He was on death row and had an execution date. I think it was the 17th of August, the year that I went. It was, it was prior to August 17th. And those brothers in Uganda, they surrounded the U.S. Embassy and they shut it down. And they said that if anything happened to Mumia, they challenged the U.S. Embassy. U.S. Embassy, they didn't know anything about Mumia in Uganda. But I noticed that when I got back, they took him off death row. And they didn't execute him August the 17th in that year. But there's a whole lot of things that are happening in the world and Africa needs us and we need Africa. So that's what I have to say. That's all I have to Thank say. you. Thank you for that. Um, Seiko, do you maybe want to uh, give us some parting words? Yes. Uh, I think... Uh... 
I probably would go back to this, my same uh, theme that I, I spoke of earlier. Uh, people need to find out, know who it is that have fought for them, who it is that have struggled for them, and uh, try to uh, remember them. I think just in terms of struggle, period, I think we need to encourage our, our youth to learn their history, especially learn the history of struggle uh, throughout the years that African people have been here and throughout the, the same years that African people were struggling on the continent. That uh, it is a rise struggle. I, I, I agree with uh, Brother Campbell that, that we have to look to Africa as Africa looks to us, because Africa looks to us to, uh, uh, to, to lead almost. Uh, when I was over there myself, uh, uh, many of the, 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 uh, the uh, different liberation movements that we, uh, we had uh, good relations with was always saying that they needed us to up our game here in the States and that if we are successful, it'll take all the weight off of them over there and they'll be successful. So uh, I believe that we need to, to encourage our youth, our young folks, because that's what the struggle is about. It's about, it's about our future and our future is obviously our youth. And we have to encourage them to learn the history, learn the history of African people in this country and African people on the continent and African people in the diaspora and, and take the best of the lessons and use them to create uh, new modes of struggle here in this country. I'm very uh, encouraged uh, seeing all the youth that have been trying to get involved in the last year or so, it's been very encouraging. And I think that that's, that's one of the things that we need to do is encourage them to study, encourage them to learn and to use their history to, to uh, guide their, their struggle. Thank you. Uh, Hank, is there anything you'd like to say? I don't know. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay. Wait a minute. Sean's calling me. Hi, Hank. Yes, Sean. Hello? Hello? Hi. Yeah. Can I... Uh... Go ahead. I'm amazed by the young folks. I still work with young people. I work on these campuses. I work with uh, Black Lives Matter. And uh, I've always been, uh, you know, I've always worked with young people ever since I was. Hey, hey, we're gonna... Hello? We can hear you. Okay. So, um, you know, I, I, I tell them all the time, they're smarter and quicker. And, uh, you know, they're better than we were, okay? And uh, there's nothing wrong with that because uh, that represents progress. But they're no better than we were, than we haven't progressed any. So, uh, uh, they live in a world that I have difficulty figuring out right now. This is a, this is a different world than mine. So uh, I have to follow their lead and just be there 
uh, to offer them whatever guidance I can based on my experiences. And uh, I think they're doing an amazing job managing our current condition. And uh, I'm proud of them, frankly, you know. Uh, they know if they need me, I'm there. I, I represent a, a resource. Okay. Keep uh, going, Hank. Okay. I'm, um, like, um, we need, they need to know their history, you know, the history of our struggle, our people's history, our contributions, our successes, and our mistakes. And that's why, that's my value to them. Uh, and that's what I try to give them. And, um, other than that, uh, they're trying to bring on a world, a, uh, a, a parallel universe almost, you know. And I think it's great, you know. Uh, there needs to be a, we need to put an end to this uh, uh, racist uh, uh plantation capitalist world we live in right now. So uh, I'm all for it. I'm I'm there for them. Okay. Thank you, Hank. Appreciate that. Eric, I'm gonna throw it to you to close us out. You're, you're muted, Erica. Thank you very much. And I, I want to thank Akinsanya, Seku, and Hank, and you also, Nathaniel, and all the people listening. And I want to say something that I hope doesn't sound contrary at all to everything we've been saying before this moment. But it's important for us to... Um, support young people in learning. The books don't have it. They don't have book lists like we do. We know who's writing what and what's good. And I think that we need to, um, places like Freedom Archives as an example, make information available and be willing to talk with someone. I'll never forget a young man in high school, when I asked, you know, it, intuitively I knew that they didn't know very much about African American history, much less African history. And I was about to say something about Malcolm X and it dawned on me, I was in a high school in East Oakland and they may not know him. And I said, do you know Malcolm X? And their response was, yeah, that movie with Denzel. I was not shocked or surprised. Um, there was no blame in my heart. We owe it to young people to come up with ways. Um, this is why I speak everywhere that people ask me. Um, but I can't do it alone. Come up with ways to help people understand the history because it's complex. It isn't complicated. It's just complex and nuanced and very, very, very rich. And it includes other people of color. And I wanna say that one of the things that I loved about the Black Panther Party that drew me to it and kept me there is that we form coalitions. And I'll never forget Fred Hampton talking about the Young Patriots and the Young Lords Party and the Black Panther Party, Puerto Ricans, poor white people and black folks. Oh, the government hated that he was talking like that because we're talking about, as we used to say, 
in the day, the masses of people. So every time I hear about those babies and children at the walls of, at the borders of the United States, those are my babies. We don't call them black babies, but they're ours. And, and there's a similarity in what happens to people of color in the United States and in the West that is, um, has been made okay by anti-black racism. So I wanna say that coalition building is a strong thing, like between, as you said, between Africa and African Americans, but also between people of color wherever they are in the world. And I learned this as I travel. I see it, I hear it, I feel it. And I want to encourage us to have a big stomach for the challenges of other people and big heartedness for at least sending them our best wishes. So, and that, that this is an expression of love. And I wanna end by saying something that I said to some teenagers when they asked me, well, what can I do? It's all so sad. And there are just so few of us. I said, no, they're not. There are many of us. And you and I are one of many. But love is a great power. Use it to transform your world. So thank you again. Thank you everyone for such rich and thoughtful reflections this evening. I really appreciate y'all taking some time to be with us and be with me and answer all my questions. Uh, I wanna say thank you, uh, Akinsanya, Seku, Hank and Erica, Thank you, Diane and Matef, for writing the book and bringing us together. Uh, and thanks to Haymarket for providing the platform and, um, and doing the captions. Uh, and uh, thank everyone out there for tuning in. And we really appreciate it. And for all of the resources that were shared and ideas, I hope that we can all follow up on the one, you know, follow up when, when appropriate and, and start integrating that into our practice. So thanks everyone for being with us tonight. And we thank hope you well. Thank you. Yeah.